Vcast, supporting women entrepreneurs in Southern Alberta, with your host Jenny Bourne. Welcome to Vcast, recorded on Treaty Seven lands, home of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains and the Métis Nation Region Three. Today, we bring you the November episode of WeCast monthly fall podcast series, produced by WeSTEM, the Women Entrepreneur in STEM program, here to support all women entrepreneurs in rural regions of Southern Alberta. WeSTEM is made possible thanks in part to funding from the Government of Canada's Women Entrepreneurship Strategy through Economic Development Lethbridge. The WeCast podcast is here to amplify the voices and tell the stories of self-identified women entrepreneurs and those who support them across the rural regions of Southern Alberta. Please join us in conversation with women business owners and advisors from Southern Alberta as we build community in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. My name is Jenny Bourne, and I am the Senior Program Coordinator for the WeSTEM program and the host of WeCast. Alyssa Borix, our technical producer and WeSTEM's event coordinator is also here with us today. I am very excited to welcome today's guest to WeCast, medical doctor and owner of the Campbell Clinic in Lethbridge, Alberta, Dr. Mishka Singh. Dr. Singh is a South African born family physician who enjoys working with a diverse group within the population she serves. She graduated in 2010 from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Nelson Mandela School of Medicine in South Africa. Whilst working in South Africa, she worked in trauma, emergency medicine, and obstetrics. She moved to Canada in 2015 and has since completed all Canadian licensing exams, as well as the exams of the College of Family Physicians Canada. She currently serves a full panel of patients within the Lethbridge community. She enjoys community service and just recently returned from a trip abroad, volunteering with Katrinos at a refugee camp in Lesbos, Greece. Dr. Singh realizes that technology is the way of the future, which motivated her to complete a few short courses on artificial intelligence in healthcare through MIT and Harvard. She endeavors to continue to improve her skills in her field to continue to help the community she serves. And I know that we appreciate her and all that she does for Lethbridge. So welcome, Dr. Singh. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate the time that you are giving us because I know how busy you are. In fact, I'm not sure that my introduction really does justice (laughs) to your background and all that you do. Is there anything that I have missed or that you would like to elaborate on that you think our listeners should know about you? Hi, Jenny. Thanks for having me on. This was great. That was an amazing introduction. I actually want to correct one thing. I'm one of seven owners. So (laughs) don't want to take all the credit there. I love medicine. I also love art. So I I like painting and music. not amazing at it, but that's one of the things I use to de-stress. But yeah, that was a great introduction. Excellent. You know, very interesting. Last month, our guest was an engineer. Yes. And she also is an artist. She's oh, really? a dancer and a musician as well. So I'm She's probably a great time. engineering and art probably go well together. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I know you're one of seven owners, but you're still, you're still an owner, right? That's true. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So this actually will just take me to one of my many questions I have for you today that we probably won't uh, have a chance to get to all of them, but I think it's a good point. People think of doctors as a career. I want to be a doctor. I want to help people. I want to be in medicine, but they don't think of being a doctor as being a business owner, right? So it's very difficult to be a doctor and not be an entrepreneur. So how do you reconcile those two worlds or balance being a doctor and a a part owner of a clinic? Yeah, I think that's really important. Like with medicine, you don't get taught anything about business. You literally, at university, it's just medicine. It's nothing else. So talking to other people and other industries like law or accounting that helps a lot or forming different networks 
Also a few short courses on business or reading does help. And then the best part about Campbell Clinic is that we have an amazing manager because he's really good at managing. There's three clinics that we have. It allows us to be doctors and do what we're good at and just have to like make executive decisions and have a few meetings a year. So I think that's one of the most important things to hire a good manager. Yeah. You you couldn't have the time to be a full-time manager and no, not at all. And a doctor. And I don't know. Yeah, doctors are not very good at work. So <laughs> 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 you said that I did not say that. <laughs> so any of the business courses that you did take, you mentioned you took a few, was that after you finished your education as a in the- Yeah, that's after med school and it's pretty short courses. If you like in South Africa, you do you go straight into medicine. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't give you a lot of time to do anything else, but if one was thinking of doing medicine in Canada, I would say do a business course as part of your undergrad. That would really help. Did you go directly from high school into majoring in medicine? Yeah. So you're literally 17 or 18 years old and you get thrown into med school. Wow. That is quite, quite. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's, that's amazing that you knew at such a young age. When I was 17, I, I would never have imagined what, (laughs) <laughs> what I would have been doing 20 or 30 years later. So when did you know? When did you know that you wanted to be a physician? Honestly, I think it was while I was studying medicine. Because you come straight out of high school, you don't know what your future looks like. You don't know what you really want to do. Even at, like at 17, you don't even know what a doctor actually does. You see your doctor uh, when you go in for a sore throat and that's your full interpretation or like if your mom's having a baby. So it's all the good experiences usually. So I had applied for medicine, um, engineering and accounting. And like here, medicine is pretty difficult to get into. So a lot of our teachers were telling us like, oh, you won't get into medicine or it's really difficult. So I didn't really think I would get into it. And then I did and I was like, oh, actually maybe I can do this. And so I started medicine and the first two years are just biochemistry. So it's a lot of studying. It's not what you're really doing. So it's not enjoyable. It's just long hours of studying. And then when we started clinical work in third year, I realized it's something that I would like to do. It's something that I enjoyed. I enjoyed working with people. I liked helping people. I liked the surgery aspect as well. So I think it would have been third year of med school. You so you were about twenty, yes, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah. pretty young, yeah. And in your intro, I mentioned that when you were in South Africa, you focused. Uh, one of your focuses was obstetrics. Yes. Uh, now you're a family physician. So when did you decide to pursue that? That was when I came to Canada. Well, I did a bit in South Africa, but um, again, the system's quite different in South Africa. It's divided into public and private. Mm -hmm. So I was in public. And so you don't have the resources that you have here. It's basically you're just churning over patients, just trying to do the best you can with the little resources. Whereas here you can identify problems. You can actually be a primary physician. You can use primary prevention to prevent high blood pressure, prevent diabetes. And that's when I thought that I'd really be able to make a difference. And I enjoy like the variety that you get to see as a family physician. Right. So was, if you don't mind my asking, was it a lot of additional education when you came to Canada because the systems are so different or was it just a matter of writing exams? It was just, so in terms of the systems being different, I think it's just the logistics, but the actual medical stuff is the same. So I just had to do an entrance exam. I did that when I was in South Africa. And Mm. when I came across, I had a three month period of supervision. So I did that in Medicine Hat. So you're practicing just with a doctor um, who supervises to make sure that everything you're doing is correct. And also like there's little things like drug names are different, Mm -hmm. um, brand names, little things like that. So you have those three months to get used to it. And then after the licensing exam, you're actually fine to practice, but I chose to do 
oh, sorry, after the entrance exam, you're fine to practice. But then I chose to do those licensing exams and the family practice exam. So it's the College of Physicians of Canada. So you don't have to do that, but I thought it was a good idea to get that done. That's great. So how did you decide to come to Canada? And if you started out in Medicine Hat, how did you make your way to Lethbridge? So as a teenager, I always wanted to travel to kind of move abroad from South Africa, I think largely because of the crime in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Like it's a beautiful country, but the crime's not great. So when I finished med school, I looked at a number of different countries. So I looked at Ireland, the US, Australia, the UK, and Canada. And Canada was actually recruiting doctors at the time. So Alberta Health Services flew me over to see Canada, to see Alberta, and to see different clinics in Alberta. So I actually went to Slave Lake, Grand Prairie, and Edmonton, as well as Lethbridge. And so Slave Lake, the mayor actually took me up in a helicopter, showed me the town, tried to like get me to stay there. But Lethbridge was the closest south and my roommate was moving three months before me. So I thought that it would be a good place to be. So yeah, so that's how I decided on Lethbridge. And in terms of the other countries, Canada made it really nice, the transition Mm -hmm. um, from South Africa to Canada. It was really easy. And the process was really nice. So that's why I ended up choosing Canada. That's good to know, because I know for foreign trained professionals in many different fields coming to Canada, sometimes that transition and the licensing can be uh, very stressful and a detriment, right? So way to go, Alberta. I'm glad to hear that they they make it easier for. I think that kind of stopped because I came in 2015 and it kind of stopped in 2016. Um, so I don't know if it's as easy anymore, but when I came, it was great. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm happy. Yeah, yeah I'm happy yeah. you're here anyway. <laughs> so I'm wondering, do you find dealing with patients because there's probably a cultural difference, and then you had the public and private in uh, South Africa, and here you have your own practice. So do you find dealing with patients different? Yeah, like the scope of practice is very different. Mm-hmm. Um, like I saw a lot of HIV and tuberculosis in South Africa, right. whereas here it's a lot more lifestyle diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, a lot of cancers as well. So in terms of that, there's a little bit more reading or learning that I had to do. And there's also a lot of autoimmune diseases that we don't see in South Africa. In terms of the actual patient population, yeah, there'd be a difference. When I was in South Africa, a lot of my patients actually didn't speak English. So in that way, it's probably easier here that I can actually have uh, like good communication with the patients. And there's probably a little bit more demand or expectations, just given that it's it's not fully private, but there's there's more resources here than there was in South Africa. Whereas in the public system in South Africa, it was just quick turnover, like here's your problem, deal with it. And that was it. There wasn't too much follow-up just because of the volume of patients you had to get. Right. Yeah. So you weren't really given the opportunity to build relationships. Exactly. So that's much better here. Uh, whereas you can build relationships and I've been here six years now. So I know some patients for the full six years. I've seen patients from the day they're born to six years old. So that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and you get to know each of the patients, what's what's what they need, what their comfort levels are. So that's been really good. And you can promote their health, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're dealing with each family and each person over a period of time. Yeah. I don't know if it's a cultural phenomenon or just my personal (laughs) approach to my own health, but I think it's so important to have that relationship and trust with your your healthcare provider. People don't like, it's not the dentist. But it's still not like you don't love going to the doctor. So you do want to have that like comfort level. Yeah, exactly. So I know right now in Lethbridge, there is a a shortage of doctors for sure. But when I first moved here, there were plenty and I could actually like shop for lack of a better word, like shop doctors because I came from other provinces where I couldn't have a doctor at all. So I was able to find the best fit, you know, where we could build that relationship. So how do you uh, focus? Yeah. How do you build those relationships with patients? I think just getting to know 
each person the little things that they like, like things that you can uh, have a conversation about, like hobbies, um, travel. And I think that's all done in the meet and greet where you get to know them and you remember those little things. Mm -hmm. And also like each patient is different. What their needs are, are different. So like someone might have anxiety and want a tablet to fix it. Whereas another patient might want therapy before they choose the medication option. So you have to work with each patient and see what's the best fit for them. And I think that's yeah important in retaining relationships and building their trust and trying to understand them. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for focusing on that. That's what, <laughs> what makes you a good doctor. Do you feel that your background or any of your past experiences uniquely prepared you to be a physician? I never liked going to the doctor as a child. I probably still don't. Uh, so that I think that gives me an understanding and I'm able to empathize with patients coming in mm -hmm. so that I, I know that some patients are really scared of coming in and you can create a level of comfort where they are, where you are approachable and they can chat to you. So that helped. In terms of other experiences growing up, I touch wood, I've never really needed the doctor for much. So I, yeah, I don't think there's too much growing up that I, that would have created a unique situation for becoming a physician. Right. Yeah. Well, fortunately, you did, fortunately, not, yes. did not need to see a doctor a lot yeah. in your youth or anything. Yeah. That's good. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about your time volunteering um, in Greece with Katrinos? Yeah. yeah. So that was actually quite recent. So I went in August. Um, it was a period of three weeks. So from August to September. And it's the first time I've ever done something like that. So I was planning on going last year and then COVID hit and I was able to do it this year. So mm -hmm. the organization is called Katrinos, like you said. Ambulances in Greece are yellow. So that's why they came up with that name. Okay. The... NGO, so the non-government organization, is actually situated in the UK, but their hands-on team is in Greece, and it's in an island called, or on an island called Lesbos, mm -hmm. um, and that's where the refugee camp is. Uh, so it's 15 k's by sea from Turkey, and that's how the refugees arrive on boats and are taken to a refugee camp where we had our medical clinic set up and we were able to see them, see the new arrivals, test for COVID. And once they were settled into the, the camp, they were able to see us for any other needs that they might have. So we saw a lot of mental health patients, some chronic patients with like high blood pressure, and then a little bit of flus and colds and that sort of thing. It was a very unique experience. Like I had never worked in a situation like that like in South Africa we weren't we were in situations where it wasn't resourced but patients were settled there that was their home yes. whereas here it was transitioning between a camp and what they were going to go on to so some of those um, refugees would be in that camp for one to two years mm -hmm. and it was just a tent with a porta potty and there was like thousands of these tents set up while they were waiting for asylum in different countries that would hopefully accept them. Yeah. yeah. Were they coming from different countries as well? Yeah. So they came through Turkey, but they were coming from, there's a lot of Afghanistani refugees and then Syrians, as well as Congolese and from Cameroon. So that was quite a journey, but we did see a lot of Congolese and um, people from the Cameroon. Largely, I, I think, I don't know too much about the political situation down there, but I think there's a lot of war. There's also a lot of discrimination. And yeah. so that's why, yeah. Were they still coming through Turkey? Mm -hmm. They would still come through Turkey. So they'd fly from whichever country. They would try to fly to Turkey. And so what happens is when they reach the Turkish airport, they're given a visa, but just for 19 days. And so in those 19 days, they have to decide whether they want to remain on in Turkey or to leave and try to get asylum in another country. Mm -hmm. So that's what they had to do. And the problem, I think, with remaining on in Turkey is that they weren't given jobs, like actual jobs or bank accounts or right. things like that. So that's why I think a lot of them wanted to move on to try and 
set up a life for themselves. Right. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. I'm going to try not to just talk to you about this because I probably did, <laughs> but I do have one more question. Because you are there during COVID pandemic, yeah. if people did, because it's a camp, I know it's yeah. not in, in Greece proper. So if people were testing positive, was there a place for them to quarantine? Yes. So actually everyone, every new arrival, whether they tested positive or negative, was put into, it was like a container and they were there for 14 days. So for the quarantine period, and then they would be given the tent that they were assigned to. Right. Yeah. That's good. So do you, yeah. this was your first time with Katrinos, but do you have time to do a lot of international work or volunteer? No, I was grateful to be able to do that for, I was actually able to travel for a week after that. So I was there for a month. So I was very grateful to be able to get that time to do it, but I don't know if I'll be able to do that in the future. If I can, I would love to, right. but I, I don't know if, if it's possible. Yeah. It's hard to find the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I understand. Well, good for you. Good for you for going great, yeah. and making a difference. So back to Southern Alberta again. Yeah. Totally changing gears. My next question is, if you had the opportunity to do anything to improve health or healthcare in rural Alberta, what would your recommendation be? There's a couple things. So technology would be a big thing. So I would actually, there's a long wait list for the MRI and CT scans. So if we could get another CT scan and MRI, that would be amazing. And then maybe we could cut down that time. I know a lot of the MRIs aren't 100% necessary, but a lot of them are. So it would be great to be able to wait like a month or two months versus a year for an MRI. And then in terms of the technology, like you mentioned, I did a few artificial intelligence courses, and I think that is going to be the way of the future. So right now, I think AHS is trying to get us all on one system. But if, if the whole country could be on one healthcare system where we would be able to access all healthcare providers, testing, therapeutics, and diagnostics, that would be great. And not just like doctors, but massage therapists, chiros, physiotherapists, just to see what's being done, the intervention that's being chosen. And that would help with our own diagnosis and treatment of the patient. Beyond that, it would also help with research. So if you could put researchers, like medical researchers on the same network, they would be able to have access to different patients with unknown or symptoms where we haven't been able to diagnose them. And there would be a lot more input because there'd be so much more, so many more people that would be able to use this resource and you'd be able to get answers to, I think, a lot more problems than we currently are getting just because of access. So right now, you mean um, you would like to see that you have access to other doctors' patients' records so you could cross-reference? Is Not that Not really. Mean? Well, no. I mean, with permission from the patient for similar diagnoses. But I mean, all, all stakeholders in that one patient's therapeutics, diagnoses, and interventions. So if patient A was seeing chiro massage, different specialists, I'd be able to access all of that, whether they are doing that here or in Ontario. That would be oh, great. I see what you mean. Okay. And then even if the patient were able to access that, like have it on a dashboard, Yep. And like maybe a chat where they give consent and they're able to chat with patients with similar diagnoses and they could have like a support group, especially when like there's rare diseases where not many patients have that. They can talk to each other and even allow researchers to have access to that information to help with interventions and new research or cures. It's pretty idealistic, but it what is. Yeah, I think you should put together a proposal. Yeah. Can help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really actually surprised that that's not already kind of available, In. but I guess it is locally. Right? It is for Alberta, and it's just doctors that can access it, though. Doctors, and well, and now I think optometrists and I think dentists can also access it now. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, if you, my next very hypothetical question for you is. If you had, let's say, $100 million to spend on health tech, 
Okay, so <laughs> specifically on tech, because I know you do have an interest in AI, there's no red tape. How would you spend it? So is this what you would propose? I think I would propose that. That would be my, the biggest thing. And then while doing one of the courses, I think it was the one through MIT, there was actually a a doctor who was doing research on something called an Emerald device. It's really cool. It looks like a Wi-Fi modem and you put it in the patient's room. So it would be for nursing home patients. Mm -hmm. And instead of monitoring their blood pressure physically or monitoring their pulse or their heart rate, it actually detects the waves in the room, like from the pulse or from them breathing. And it's able to go into a database and their doctor is able to see their heart rate, their blood pressure, even their sleep cycles. So if they're not sleeping well, or if they're not getting enough deep sleep, they can detect that and diagnose even before the patient knows what's going on. So that would be great. That's very interesting. But that's happening now or? Yeah, so that actually, that technology exists. I think it's being used in the US in private settings. Are there questions surrounding privacy with it? Because Um, I think it goes, because it's like a modem, it goes straight into the doctor's database. So nobody else can access it. So in terms of that, it's pretty secure. Right. You just need the approval. You just need the approval of the patient. Yeah. Right. Yeah, instead of like all those monitors. And even now for sleep studies, you have so many monitors on the patient, whereas this is just a box and they can put it in their bedroom and you can monitor their sleep without that weird environment with the Mm -hmm. cords and yeah. So it would be a much more natural reading, especially if people have, what's it called? Like white coat phobia, right? Yes. Suddenly they're- Yeah, blood pressure. I get that all the time, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Do you spend a lot of time doing research yourself or are you focused on patient care? I'm more focused on patient care. When I do get the chance, I do a few of those courses, but it's more patient care that I enjoy doing. Like more the hands-on work. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you have lots of great ideas. So that's (laughs) why I thought I'd ask if you're doing this on the side. So for you personally, you're one of seven owners. You're a busy doctor. How do you balance your personal and professional lives? I try to make sure that I have specific time sets out for different things. Like I have, so my husband and I have a personal trainer that we see twice a week and that's been really great. And then I do paint and I try to set out one night a week to do that. And then I try to spend some time in the evenings with, or like one evening every couple of weeks with some of my girlfriends. Yeah. So I think I do have a pretty decent work-life balance. Excellent. What do you paint? I enjoy abstracts. So I have a lot of abstract paintings around my house. And then I do do, I've done a few landscapes. So like farm landscapes or the mountains. But what I enjoy doing is the abstracts because it allows you to express who you are and the colors and all the, the joy of doing that. Do you ever have an exhibition? So someone was mentioning an exhibition but I haven't ever done one. Are you self-taught? I did do classes when I came to Canada, actually. So it was through, it was called the studio downtown. Mm -hmm. And I did that once a week and our instructor actually retired. So we've been, the class has actually continued on at CASA one day a week. So we do it by ourselves. Oh, awesome. Which is nice. I have a question. You have six partners, right? In your clinic? So yeah. how did you find each other? Actually, I think I'm the last partner that's joined. So the other ones have been part of the Campbell Clinic group. So you usually come as a doctor just working at the clinic. And if you want to, you can ask to buy in. And it's usually been really nice that we only have a maximum of 10 partners at a time. So there's always been a time where partners have retired yeah. and we've had interest and new people have come in and bought it in. So it's just literally been word of mouth and just good timing. Right. So you didn't have to go through starting your own personal practice no, with renting is, your own space. and that Yes, which I was thinking about doing originally, but I'm glad that I was able to find Campbell Clinic. Um, it makes it way easier and I didn't have to do too much of the admin stuff. Right. Do you ever have conflict or does the manager take care of most things. You mean with the partners? Yeah, with decision making. 
we usually have meetings for that and then we usually take a vote and I think we all kind of think alike so Mm -hmm. we haven't I haven't come across a a time when we've had conflict which is really good yeah Yeah, there was actually someone who wanted to buy the clinic at the beginning of this year and all seven of us didn't want that to happen so that was great yeah that's good usually when you have seven different brains in the room right it's hard to consensus so that's that's fantastic to have a good working relationship. If you could go back, let's turn back time to when yes. you first, let's say when you first decided to come to Canada. So you're starting as a doctor in Canada. Is there anything that you would do differently or advice that you would have given to your 2015 self? It was actually a really smooth transition. So like I said, Alberta Health Services had got me to come over. And then when I did come over, to Medicine Hat, everything kind of sort of worked out. Like I was able to find a place to rent uh, really easily. When I moved to Lethbridge, that the same kind of thing happened. Mm -hmm. There was a doctor at the old clinic in Medicine Hat that had a place here that allowed me to rent that. And I was first at Legacy Medical and it was a really nice environment. It was very family orientated. So that was really easy to get along with everyone. And then I met my husband two months after I came. So that made it really comfortable. And he was Canadian. So he was able to like tell me things I didn't know. So that was really nice. And I made quite a few, I I made a lot of effort to make friends, but I made really good friends. So it was a really nice, smooth transition. There wasn't anything that I would change. So I'd probably tell myself that it was all going to be okay, that it was a good decision. That's great. So if you were talking to new graduates in Canada who are women and, you know, starting out on their medical careers, is there any advice that you would give them? Try to balance work and life. Make sure you have time for yourself, whether it be going to the gym or just doing a hobby that you like doing. Also, so when you say new graduate, someone that's done med school. Yeah, they're just, yeah. they're graduating next week. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. So that would be the most important. And then secondly, do your paperwork every day because you don't want it to build up. And doctors are really bad at doing that. <laughs> so make sure you get that done. Whether you leave an hour late, get your paperwork done because you don't want to be there at the end of the month and have like a load of referrals to send off and unsigned documents. <laughs> yeah. When you say paperwork, do you mean internally or like referrals and stuff or for the government, for AHS? I mean, like referrals. We have a lot of like disability forms that you have to fill out, lab work that you go through, faxes, all of that paperwork. I mean, also personal paperwork you should get done too, which we kind of leave. But yeah, the medical side is important to get through. And you have a manager for the clinic, so they can take care of the, the, the running of the clinic and exactly. pay sure those bills are paid. And, All paid and done. And yes. Yeah. So I guess I don't want to speak for you, but I guess good advice if you're going to run your own clinic is hire an excellent manager. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay. I have one last question for you. What yeah. does the not so distant future look for you? Do you have plans for the next 12 months? for you professionally or personally? Well, I've been wanting to volunteer more. So I've been looking at different organizations that I can volunteer with. So Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to be able to do that on a more consistent basis in the next 12 months. Locally, you mean? Locally, yeah, like local organizations. And then I do want to invest more money in commercial real estate to get more business stuff and passive income going. So I'm hoping to be able to do that as well in the next 12 months. Maybe a little bit more travel, but we'll see if that, if COVID allows that and if I can do that. So you've got some plans. You've got some yes. plans for the next 12 months. Well, that is great. Thank you so much, Dr. Michelle, <laughs> for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your story and for sharing your experiences being a, a family physician, owning your own clinic with other partners and uh, your journey to get here. So thank you. It's so a much. pleasure. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this. It was, was great. We want to hear from you. 
Is there a question that you'd like us to answer on our next podcast? Send it in to westem at chooselethbridge.ca. WeCast is a production of the Women Entrepreneurs in STEM program. WeSTEM is made possible thanks in part to funding from the Government of Canada's Women Entrepreneurship Strategy. For more information, visit our website at westem.ca or contact westem at chooselethbridge.ca. Thanks for listening.